You look good. Good. So, would everyone agree that we all face storms in our lives? Is there anyone here that does never face a storm? <laughs> all right, we got one. Is there another? I think we all face storms in our lives. In fact, when I look at my own life, I really feel like I'm either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going in a storm. It seems like it's a constant process through our life here. You know, uh, have you ever prayed for peace? Prayed for peace. Lord, please give me peace. Every day. Every day I pray, Lord, please give me peace. So if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, as we're told he is in Isaiah 9, 6, why does it seem like the peace never comes? So I say it again, if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, why does it seem that the peace never comes? So tonight we're going to explore that question a little bit to see if we can get our arms around it. The text we're going to be in tonight is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. I'm going to read through it, give a little background and context, and then we'll drill down into the verses and see what Jesus has to say to us about peace. So verse 35, chapter 4 of Mark. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So there are actually two stories in the Gospels that are similar. In one, they both involve disciples in a boat, in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. One involves this, and the other involves Jesus walking on the water and Peter getting out of the boat. So there are actually two different stories uh, emphasizing different um, aspects of, uh, of an issue. So before we get into the text verse by verse, I want to give some background. I'm going to start by uh, telling you a little bit about Mark. Mark was the son of a wealthy mother, lived in Jerusalem, and was probably a young kid when Jesus' public ministry was being carried out. In fact, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, he writes a strange verse in chapter 14 that surrounds the evening that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the soldiers came to get him. Mark is the only Gospel writer that mentions the young boy that was witnessing this that basically was chased and got away. And uh, there are many that believe that Mark was actually writing about himself. So he was a young boy uh, somewhat an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry, but this occurred before he was an adult. So Mark, because he wasn't a constant eyewitness, as were Matthew, John, uh, he received much of the content of his gospel from Peter. Uh, and uh, he also accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey. So he definitely had been around the block a few times and was qualified to write this gospel, which was written about 25 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, written between A.D. 55 and 59. Now, the other thing that's interesting about the Gospel of Mark is that it's written for Gentile believers. It's not written to the Jewish population. And his focus were actually Gentile Romans who are converting, or in the process of converting to Christianity. 
And the thing that's different about Mark is you have no genealogies in it. There's very little attention given to uh, the different Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the scribes. Um, there are the fewest references in all the Gospels to the Old Testament, so he doesn't really pay a lot of attention to that. He focuses more on what Jesus did than on what he said, so it's a Gospel of action. And the term immediately is peppered throughout the entire Gospel, so it's a, it's a Gospel of action. And interestingly, he used more Latin words in his Gospel. There really weren't Latin words used in the others, but because he was writing to a Roman audience, he substituted Latin words for the Greek and Aramaic words that appear in the other Gospels. So, although it's one of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that view Jesus' life from a similar perspective, it's really very different than, uh, than Matthew and Luke in the respects that I just mentioned. Because Mark tailored his presentation so that it would be relevant to the people who are hearing it. It's a good lesson, I think, that we should all learn. As we're out ministering in the world, I think we should all learn that our ministries should be relevant to our audience. I think Paul was a master of that, and he actually wrote a few verses, giving himself away in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 23. What he said is, to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partic partaker of it. So this is really what Mark was doing. He was tailoring his gospel to be relevant to the people that were receiving his gospel. And so when you go back and think, no genealogies, you know, the Romans wouldn't have known anything about genealogies. He ditches it. No preoccupation with the scribes and the Pharisees to the extent of the other gospels, because it wouldn't have meant anything to the Roman here. Uh, the... Um, fewer references to the Old Testament because the Romans wouldn't have cared about the Old Testament. So he was tailoring this to the reader. So now with, uh, with that, let's go through it verse by verse. There's some very cool things in this passage that I want to point out as we go through it. So verse 35, On that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. It was uh, seemingly a long day. In fact, when you read back, this is in chapter 4 of Mark. When you go back to chapter 2 of Mark, that's where the day started. So uh, in those chapters, Mark reviews just what kind of day Jesus had. It started in Capernaum, which is was his headquarters. Capernaum is at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. He healed a paralytic. He healed a cripple. He called his 12 apostles on that day. He taught directly and through parables that day. His mother and brothers came to take him away because they thought he had lost his mind. And uh, at the end of that long day, he was beat. So he said, let us go over to the other side. Now, chapter 5 would tell us that the other side is what was known as the land of the Gerasenes. It was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. It was a pagan area. And interestingly, today it's the Golan Heights, about two-thirds of which is controlled by Israel, and about one-third of which is controlled by Syria. So it's a zone of conflict today. It was a pagan area then, and Jesus wanted to go there to get some rest. He was a glutton for punishment, for sure. So leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Have you ever had enough of people and said, get me out of here? I've had too much. Why do I have to love these people? That was what Jesus was saying. Then he's saying, get me out of here. Let's go to the other side. He had had enough for the day. It's interesting in verse 36, it says the disciples took them along with them, took him along with them in the boat just as he was. 
just as he was. He was utterly exhausted. So I have this vision of them just kind of carrying him into the boat because he was wiped out after this long day of ministering to people. Now, I think another important point about this is that Mark in this passage, I think, really emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. You know, Jesus, the mystery of Jesus is that he was fully God, and yet he was fully man. And here, Mark is illustrating the humanity of Jesus, being exhausted after a long day of ministry. And then, finally, in verse 36, there's the strange phase, phrase, and other boats were with him. I've always wondered what that's all about. And I have this belief that God never engages in idle acts. Everything that's in here is here for a reason. So I did some thinking and digging to try to figure that out because the other boats aren't ever mentioned again. They're only mentioned at the beginning of this jury, uh, journey. And so why are they mentioned at all? So as we go further into the story, we'll see that the theme of this passage is fear and faith. Fear and faith. And we'll see as we go through the remaining verses how the disciples, the occupants of that boat, were scared to death and probably thought that they were the only ones that had ever been subjected to a harrowing experience like the one they were subjected to. But the other boats were with them. The other boats were with them. And that's a lot like us. When we're scared, when we're feeling fear, we feel like we're the only ones in the world that are experiencing this. We feel isolated and cut off from God, but the other boats are with us. We should remember in those times of fear that we're not alone. The stormy sea that we're on, others are traveling on that sea as well. So now we move to verse 37. They get in the boat, Jesus is wiped out, he's had it with people, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were so were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And you might say, well, this is the Sea of Galilee. It's a lake. How could it be like that? How could it be like that? Well, it is. Sea of Galilee, a few statistics. 14 miles long, about, about 8 miles wide. So it's a good-sized lake. It's very shallow. At the deepest spot, it's 150 feet deep. And it's the lowest freshwater lake in the world, 700 feet below sea level, very, very low. And it's surrounded by hills and valleys. The valleys act as wind tunnels, and the winds come down from the mountains, Mount Hermon principally, and they rush through the valleys, and the valleys serve as wind tunnels. So by the time the wind hits the Sea of Galilee, it creates these sudden fierce storms that just come out of nowhere. And in fact, in verse 37, the Greek word for fierce scale of wind is seismos, which is the root for our word seismic. So it's like the explosive. That's how the winds are on the Sea of Galilee. So this gale was so fierce that verse 37 tells us that the boat was filling up with water. So here are these disciples in the boat. The boat's filling with water. They're being whipped around by the storms, the wind, the rain, and Jesus is asleep. So, it makes me question why Jesus used this setting to teach his disciples this object lesson. I think it was because he was using nature, which he created, to teach them a lesson about fear. I felt many times, I'm sure everyone here has felt many times in their lives that they were being battered by life. Very similar to what the disciples were experiencing, being battered so badly that we were just sinking. And I think that's why he created this scenario in order to teach the object lesson. To set the stage for the fear that just grips all of our hearts. So now we move to verse 38. Jesus himself, now this is after we're told how frightening this whole experience was. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So the disciples were clearly freaking out. Do you not care that we are perishing? They were afraid for their lives. 
And uh, Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was sleeping. Have you ever been so tired that you could sleep through anything? Just exhausted? You don't hear the alarm clock go off. People are trying to talk to you. You're just so exhausted you're out. He was asleep like that. He was tired for sure. We know that from the earlier verse. But I think he was also making a point to the disciples. And the point was that he wasn't worried. He wasn't worried. And when we partner with the creator of the universe, we shouldn't worry either. Because we're partnered with the creator of the universe. And that was his point with these disciples. They were in the boat with the creator of that storm, with the creator of the universe. And although he was asleep, they had nothing to fear. So after they say to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 39 says, And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. The thing that is interesting to me about this is the contrast between Jesus' tranquility and the disciples' absolute panic. Does that sound familiar? Absolute panic. Jesus completely tranquil because the storm didn't worry him. He was so calm that he was asleep. So as we go through our own panic, have we ever felt that Jesus was asleep? Maybe asleep at the switch. We pray, we ask for peace, we ask for help. Jesus, get me out of this mess I'm in. And he doesn't seem to be listening. He seems like he's asleep. He's not. Look what he did here. He could deal with this storm in his sleep. And that's exactly what he did. After all, he created the storm. He could certainly control it. And he can also deal with the storms that we have in our lives. Because he created those storms as well. So listen to this. In the book of Psalms, this is actually a psalm that was written by Solomon. It kind of reveals what this is all about. It says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved, even in his sleep. This psalm tells us that God is in control of everything. And just like God was in control of that boat and that storm and those disciples. So if God's in all the details of our lives like that, and like he was in this passage we're reading, and if we really believe this, why do we worry? Why are we afraid? He asked the same question to the disciples. In verse 40, And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Do you think the disciples felt dumb? They're panic-stricken. They wake him up, he gets up, and it's calm. Have you ever felt dumb when you have had a storm in your life that God has taken care of? I have. So many times I've said, that seems so bad. But it's funny, these things always seem to work out. It's not dumb luck. It's God in all the details of our lives. And I feel kind of dumb when I do that. I feel like, when am I going to learn? When am I going to learn to trust Him? And that lasts a couple of hours, and then I revert back to my old tendencies of being fearful about the storms in my life. So why is it that we act this way? Why is it that we never learn this lesson? I think as usual, Jesus put his finger right on it here. How is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? Because it all comes down to faith. It all comes down to faith. Moving on to verse 41, the final verse. 
they became, after this little lesson, they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is kind of a remarkable verse to me. Because these guys are Jesus' own disciples. They traveled with him. They lived with him. They saw him work miracles. And they said, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Didn't these guys get the memo? Or were they just stupid? He was God. He could do anything. I don't think Jesus gave us verse 41 to show that the disciples were stupid. And I don't think he gives us verse 41 to prove somehow that we're stupid. I think he gives us verse 41 and the whole passage, for that matter, <clears throat> as a basis for a lack of fear and as a basis for confidence and most importantly as a basis for peace no matter what circumstances we face. That's why he gives us the whole passage. I need to remember this when I pray for peace. That he is the Prince of Peace and the only peace I'll ever have is through him. If I look at my circumstances, I'll be frightened. If I look at Him, if I keep my eyes on Him, and I exercise that faith muscle, and I remember every time He's pulled me through a tight spot, eventually I'll get the memo. And maybe I won't panic. And maybe my faith will be demonstrated in calmness and stability when I face the trials of life. So Jesus certainly took the disciples to school on this one. And I think he took them to school so that they could begin to learn about faith. He was teaching them about faith. We can learn the same lesson. So what does this all mean when we boil it down? It's pretty simple. The crises of life are like stormy seas. They terrify us. They destroy our stability. When I read this, in like two seconds, I would have been throwing up from nausea. I, I get seasick. And uh, not only would I have been throwing up, but I would have been scared to death. And that's fear. And that's the crises of life that terrify us and destroy our stability. But this story teaches us that Jesus isn't worried about storms. He's calm about the storms of life as well. When I'm panic-stricken, he's not <coughs> panic-stricken. He's calm. So calm that he may seem asleep. So the not-so-obvious lesson here, you know, the obvious lesson is Jesus, the creator of the universe, master over, over nature, the wind, the storms, etc. But the not-so-obvious lesson here is that Jesus was as much in control of this situation when he seemed to be asleep. And we should remember that. He was as much in control of this situation when he seemed to be asleep. And the next time we're on the verge of panic, and we don't think he's listening to us, we should remember that. I don't know about you, but I, I take comfort in knowing that Jesus isn't afraid, and that he never gets depressed and even if he doesn't wake up and quiet the storm that I'm rolling through at the moment, I'm still safe with him. I'm still safe with him. And when, when he does quiet the storm, he says to me quietly, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? So, the big point in this story is that we need to all have more faith. And we need to have that faith... And we should have that faith because the master of the universe is in the boat with us. He's in the detail of our lives. He never leaves. And although we may think he's not hearing us, and we may think he's not seeing us, he is. We have to learn by faith that that's the case. Try to avoid that fear, avoid that panic when we face those inevitable trials of life.
Can I ask what chapter you are in? Four. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Or, yeah. Mark, I, I have a question. This seems to be like a situation that came upon them. Sometimes we do things where we create the storm ourselves. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you see, how do you speak to that out of this text? Well, I, I think he used, yeah, good question. <laughs> My reactive response is that, you know, he's omniscient. He knows everything. And when we create the storm in our life, we're learning a lesson from that too. And he's with us even when we create that storm. It's a good point though. I don't feel like he abandons us just because we're the ones that created the storm. Because I think probably most of the storms in our lives we create. What do you think too? Would it be like, because when we create our own storms, it's like we are, um, we're just getting all so panicky and Fears is coming up for the things that could be, be afraid of. So it's learning about his peace. Oh, we try to teach, teach us about his peace. And tell him, you know, help us so don't be so, you know, panicking here over this situation. You just calm down. And I'll help you through this, whatever. Kind of help you learn to calm down. I, I think that's, that's really right. I think it's really right. To me, a good measuring stick of it in our lives is when we do face a difficult situation, do we just flip out or do we just kind of lean into it and just get through it? And I think as our faith grows, we won't flip out as much. We'll, I'm kind of still in the flip out stage, but I look forward to leaning into it and, and being more at peace during these difficult times. Okay, so about a year ago, I went to visit my daughter on her birthday and things happen, you know, teenagers are what they are. Although I went to LA just because of her birthday, also sacrificed some other things, she didn't show up. I make a nervous breakdown. And I was thinking about everything at that moment. Then I called my friend that I rescued two years ago from the Penn Station, but she needed help. She came over there just for five minutes. And then a uh, month after that, I'm almost to be on the street. Mm, some problems with a friend who was my landlord. And out of nowhere, the guy that I met in a bus, that we talk in a Starbucks coffee, he said, okay, my friend has a place. Um, to make the story short, I am living there and she got to meet my daughter. So the Jesus always finds a way. And I'm here. Exactly. Divine providence in our lives. And there was a storm, and now my, my friend is in that storm in Galveston, who helped me. And, you know, and we don't know what's going on with her. We hope that she's okay, because it's a terrible storm. And she, she moved from LA to, to Galveston. So it's like, it comes. Those, those storms come, sometimes come to you, and then comes to your best friend, and then another best friend is in a storm, and you know, it always goes from the peace to the storm. Always. We, we always hear saying, after the storm is a beautiful, the, the gypsies in my area, they keep saying, they always love the storm, because after that is coming the sun. Right, right. For a while, anyway. Yeah. And then the storm starts and again. Storm. But that's life. Yeah, it is life. So we have to embrace it and just believe in Jesus. He's going to help us. He's going to show up when we think they're sleeping. He's not. It would be so great to have confidence all the time that when you're facing a difficulty in life, to actually know in your heart that He's going to show up. And it's going to either be for your good and that you will get through it. But Jesus said, Scripture there. Uh, how is it that you have the faith? You know, like, as if you should have it. Yeah. Right? But faith is a gift. Uh, a gift doesn't do any good if you don't open it up and wrap it and start using it. Yeah. So, Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts is faith. So, you got to exercise what God's already given you. But it, you have to whip it up within yourself. Right. We don't believe because we, we believe because God put that 
gift in us. But we have to exercise. We have to exercise it. I think it's just like a muscle. You have to exercise your faith. Yes. Yes. Well, it's so physical. It's we need to see manifestations. We need to be true in order to become physical and form. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, in Sufism, in Sufism, which is a religious sect, which is a Muslim religion, but it's, it's a universal religion. Uh -huh. All of them. Uh, it's belief precedes manifestation. You must believe it before it can manifest into physical form. So you must believe Jesus in God in order for it to manifest. It's the essence of faith. Yeah. yeah. It is. Mark. Leslie. The Bible also says faith comes by hearing the word of God. And something that was just so kind of a little sort of tying into my brain right now, but like I think this is such a cool illustration for us on how Jesus wants us to react to fear. Because fear, like and he showed us in a very like temporal state, like he showed us with an actual physical storm. But most of the storms are not physical, they're mental. They're all going on in our mind. And what does the Bible say about the mind? It says to hold every thought captive and line it up to the Word of God. Right. So if we can get to a place where we're exercising, sort of taking a minute to think about what we're thinking about before it gets into the spin-out phase of fear, we can think about it, line it up to the Word of God, which is also what feeds our faith. Then that gives us the extra, the extra power and authority to do what he did, which was basically just rebuke that thing. I mean, he showed us in a physical form by actually just rebuking the spirit of the, the storm and telling it to go. But most of the time, we're not rebuking tornadoes. I mean, I've seen that. But, you know, most of the time, we're having to tell the fear to go or the lack of hope or, you know, whatever the enemy is barreling at us that produces all of that fear in our lives. And, and most of that is produced by the enemy. Yeah. Ephesians 6. You know, yeah. our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Hey, Mark, um, two things. First of all, I didn't mean to be for most of my reason. I didn't mean to be for most of my I'm sorry, I have had a lot of sports in my life. The worst thing, when I can rock bottom, I'm going to go back to the bus and get it. And, uh, you know, I tried to get myself where I could find anywhere to get help. And, uh, you know, I didn't have anything. I never had anything to do. I was an atheist. And I lost all hope, but I didn't see any other options. The good news is, you know, it was my first try, so I fell in where I am. But um, what I think about is we say God is going to teach us life. And I, I have like a different take on that. Um, the way I feel, he fills my heart with his love. And it feels to me like God is going to be And then he showed me the same Francis prayer, how to help others. So it feels to me like he gave me faith in his love. And then he charged me with this instruction about how to go out and help others. That's the side of well, that's an actor reading. Uh, that's exactly what he wants us to do. He wants to fill us up so we brim over and touch others. Right? Yeah. David. I, I especially like this event because I feel like um, it's real to the way human beings are. When I can see the disciples struggling against the storm and think, oh, we can manage this because they're fishermen, they know what they're doing. And after a while, they think maybe we can't manage this. And then, oh, well, should we wake up Jesus? You know, it's like this anxiety. Well, do I want to bother God with this? You know. And then finally, they bother him. You know, to to some extent, and he stands up, and rebukes the wind. So now they're even more sort of freaked out by it. And so I don't know. In my journey, I feel like there are a lot of times when I encounter something at first. At first, it starts to swirl around in my head. Well, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? You know, instead of just sitting back and letting Jesus come into that moment. I try to manage a lot of it myself. And then when I finally, the storm is big enough, I realize I can't manage it by myself. <laughs> and I ask him and he does it. And then you're like, well, uh, I don't even know how to take that. You know, it's too much for me to grasp that you're able to do that in my journey. So I feel like it's an everyday thing with whatever we encounter, our own circumstances or anything else. But at the end of it, it's like, well, I know what the end's going to be. He's going to begin the storm. So why do I get upset when the storm comes? i got to learn to not get upset when that storm's coming because I know the end. He's going to take care of it. Yeah, and it is true. And, and really, if we look at most of the things that have happened in our lives, 
it ever really happened. Didn't Mark Twain say something about that? The worst <laughs> things that have happened in my life never happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we worry about things that are going to happen, and most of them don't happen, and we think, well, I was worrying needlessly. Well, maybe you weren't. Maybe the finger of God was on you, and that's what prevented it from happening. You know, I have this on a daily basis. Between about midnight and 2 a.m., I wake up, and I have the parade of the terribles. Everything seems awful. All of the things that are bothering me are just killing me, just killing me. And it's really amazing by the time morning comes and I'm up and I start going, all of a sudden those things seem much more manageable. So it's, I think most of the fear we have, it is right here. And uh, when when we deal with it or able to deal with it through faith, we master it. And when we don't, it's because we don't have it. Because we don't have it. Oh, that's weird that what you guys were talking about. Sorry that I was late. I, I, I. So I, I went to work and all these people, it's really slow and everybody's like wanting to stay at work. And um, I mean, I need hours too. And like God's telling me, like, you know what? You're taking care of. He's like, let, you know, let them know that you want to leave. Because these family, you know, these people here have kids, you know. So, uh, and you know what? I had a lucky like, trust in that. Like, you've got to go into some life. We, we all have to trust yeah. more than that. You know, I, another point I want to make. That's why I think it's so important to read the Bible, because the Bible is the best way we have of really coming to know Jesus in an intimate way. And uh, I think through that intimate knowledge of Him, our faith strengthens, and we understand the storms of our life a whole lot better, and it makes us more capable of dealing with it. Um, it is like a, a guidebook. Living. That's why I think reading the Bible is really critical. Um, I was listening to Christian radio, and one of, one of the things they said was, um, you know how when they crossed the Jordan River, they made a um, monument or a twelve stones. Yeah, the twelve stones. What's that called? Um, altar. Altar. Yeah, right. and that altar signified the crossing of the Jordan and making it through and over to the other side. So those people had to have faith that they could cross the River Jordan. Just like we need to have that faith to cross the River Jordan. And if we look back at our lives, we will find the altars that of faith that have been placed that we placed there. That's where Jesus showed up. He showed up, you know, I have I made a list of my altars. That I built, and looking back at them, I'm like, wow, you know, those are all significant times in my life where Jesus showed up. And if, I just feel like, you know, if every morning I wake up and that's my altar, I make my altar to Him, which I lay my life down to Him, my will to Him, that you know, my day. Constant exercise. Yeah. I agree. I and agree it won't with be that. a freak storm or a freak I, train. Or <laughs> I, I agree. You'll be prepared to go into the day. Yeah. Be prepared to go into the day. That's why the Bible says over and over to remember. Remember the things you've done. Ultimately, in communion, we do it in remembrance of what he's done, right? So right. We, we remember. Okay, if he's done this, then what am I worrying about here? Yeah. Yeah. Any final questions, comments? Thank you. Sometimes you become stronger by helping the other people. Yep. Sure. Yep. Amen. To that. I agree with that. <laughs> yes. I was just wondering if farm is an acronym. Farm? No. What does farm mean? Just farm. Because everything comes farm fresh. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. You know, there's. A, I'm going to finish up. There's a very short passage in the book of Isaiah that says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And that just encapsulates 
that concept. He does walk through the water with us. He does walk through the fire with us. And uh, we don't get, we don't drown and we don't get burned because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Awesome.